Thank you all so much for joining today. I'm letting people in currently, but thank you all so much for joining today's session. Um, I do just want to make sure that I provide you all with the housekeeping rules. Uh, just make sure that you have your cameras on. We would prefer if you have your cameras on so that we can see all of your beautiful faces. Please make sure that you keep your microphones off. If you have any questions, please raise your hand, drop it in the chat. Um, and you should have received an email to me from me right before this session, uh, just talking about annual meeting sponsorship, your session attendance form, and where to register and find today's recording and past recordings. All right. Uh, we do have some speakers here for you today that will be talking about basic business etiquette. And I am very excited to you know, jump off and talk about our topic today. Okay. Um, if you all have any questions, just let me, you can message me directly um, throughout the session or you can drop it in the chat uh, if you want the speakers to also see your question. Okay. All righty. Uh, I will go go ahead and hand it over to our speakers for today so they can introduce themselves and I'll stop talking now. All right. Thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you for having us. Thank you for uh, to Aida, to the International Association uh, for Black Actuaries, the Black Actuaries um, for having us. So on behalf of the United Health Group, we will be talking about basic business etiquette. And so uh, today you'll hear from Claudia Campbell. She is a regional vice president uh, here um, in our actuarial, actuarial pricing uh, department. And um, I'm Jamila Season. I'm a healthcare economics consultant. And then Megan Schwab, she is um, a senior actuarial analyst. And so we wanted to share our contact information here with you all. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, you should be seeing some captions uh, as we're speaking. Sometimes it doesn't accurately capture what we're saying, but really to help our um, anyone who may have any kind of hearing impairment, it's just helpful to, to also see the words. So we do try to default to include that. So the words across the screen are intentional. Uh, so today we will um, talk about workplace business etiquette, uh, and then we will go into remote business etiquette. You know, as we shift more into this remote world, um, we want to emphasize things that are specific to the remote environment. Then we want to talk about the impact of defining your workspace and the importance there. And then to kind of show how all this works, we are going to do some interview uh, scenarios so that um, you, so we can kind of see how some of these practices look. And our intention is to focus really on the business etiquette there. And so I'm going to kick it off to Megan. Hi, everyone. All right, let's just hop right in. Um, workplace business etiquette. Um, we're going to talk about exactly what does it mean? Um, why does developing good etiquette matter, um, specifically in the actuarial profession? All right, next slide. All right, so let's define business etiquette. Um, it is a type of behavior that professionals are expected to follow to respect others and uphold the company's image or values. Um, etiquette can definitely vary culture to culture, but um, everyone understands and follows some sort of standards of respect. Um, it can definitely create a sense of unity in the workplace. Um, it can also just help you effectively communicate with one another. Um, so since etiquette can vary culture to culture, we wanted to provide some universal constants that can help you just get good first impressions. Um, these five universal constants can help you in instances where you haven't quite learned a group's dynamics or team norms for a company quite yet. So first, um, be on time. I think that's kind of a given. Um, we always suggest being early, uh, like five to 10 minutes early for an interview. Um, being on time shows you respect the other person's time. Um, this first step is just essential when you're making a first impression. 
Um, if you're late to an interview, it's likely that another candidate would be chosen for that role. Um, if there is something that, if this is something that you've struggled with in the past, um, definitely brushing up on some time management skills would benefit you throughout your whole career. So second universal constant would be to recognize your team. Um, this is important, um, even if you aren't a part of that company's team yet, um, taking that moment to recognize who you're speaking to, acknowledge how that person would prefer to be addressed. Um, this step just shows you're listening, shows you care, and also shows that you respect who you're speaking with. Um, lastly, the third one, oh, um, the third one is respect shared spaces. Um, this relates to both um, remote and in-person workspaces. Um, office spaces you may share with team members could include kitchens, bathrooms, like printer copy rooms, lounges, et cetera. Um, virtual spaces could include you know, Google Drive folders or any shared folders on a network, um, team channels, anything like that. So it's important just to stay organized to show business etiquette. Um, you can take some extra steps and just keeping things clean, keeping things how they were left or labeling things and you know, properly documenting any changes that you might've like worked on in a specific document. Um, fourth universal constant is to dress appropriately. Um, dress attire can also vary business to business. Some are more casual, some are more formal. Um, but when it comes to interview situations, um, we would recommend just to dress professionally without taking away from your own identity. Um, a lot has changed, especially with virtual workspaces. So it's important just to feel comfortable in your clothing um, while also dressing appropriately. And then, you know, if you're beginning a new role and you're not quite sure yet, um, we feel it's 100 percent appropriate just to jot your future manager a message to ask about the office dress policy or even virtual dress policy. Um, you can even think back to maybe your interview and try to remember what some full time employees were wearing to help. Um, just keep in mind that how you dress also directly relates to how you feel and the confidence that you give off. Uh, lastly, number five, use emotional intelligence. Um, this one's definitely easier said than done. Um, emotional intelligence is something that people develop throughout their entire lives, um, but practice makes perfect on this one. Um, emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize, regulate, and understand emotions in yourself and then eventually in others. So, Effective emotional intelligence skills can also help you emphasize with team members, um, overcome stressful challenges, and all of good managers that have made a big impact in my life definitely have high emotional intelligence. Um, also, the SOA actually puts a lot of emphasis on emotional intelligence. Um, there's trainings that the SOA has and even modules that are centered around this. Okay. Next slide. And then we just wanted to touch on business etiquette specifically in the actuarial space. Um, it was surprising to me when I had gone full time in actuarial that a lot of actuaries know other actuaries. So the connections that you're making, they, they make during SOA meetings, for example, or throughout careers, um, they're super strong. So just keep this in mind when you're making impressions at companies even if a company isn't your dream spot, um, just be mindful that the person you're talking to could know um, or and share impressions that you made with other actuaries from other companies. Okay, next slide. All right, let's switch gears to remote. Um, remote working, um, I'm a fully remote, um, a lot's changed, but we wanna ensure that we can have business etiquette remotely as well. Um, a lot of actuarial roles have transitioned to be fully remote. Um, a lot of people that I went to school with have remote jobs now. So, and even interviews, um, a lot of interviews that I've given have been fully remote. Um, so how can we be prepared and just maintain business etiquette throughout? We categorized remote business working into three categories. You can hop to the next slide. Perfect. Um, email, instant message, etiquette, phone calls, and then also video. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so we grouped email and instant message into one category because they definitely follow similar tips. It's just important to remember that um, email and instant message will always leave a paper trail. So, you know, you can't unsend an email or an IM on Microsoft Teams, you know, we just wanna take those extra steps to make sure that we're maintaining proper business etiquette. So first, and might be the most important, but proofread, um, while emails and IMs have autocorrect systems in place, um, I always make sure to just to look over my emails before sending them out, especially if it's to like a group audience or someone that is important. <laughs> um, uh, a good tip would just be to read your messages out loud. Um, I catch a lot of my mistakes when I hear what I'm saying out loud. So I'm just talking to my computer screen, <laughs> reading it out loud, and then I'll press send. <laughs> Second, just be polite and professional. This one sounds easy, but actually since that we're virtual, it can sometimes be hard to understand a coworker's tone of voice through email or IM. So you, taking those extra steps, just thanking people in an email can really change a team's dynamic. And I know that like employers, um, especially UHG, are always looking for optimistic people to be a part of our companies. So also we wanna take advantage of the fact that virtual workspaces are out there for us. So if there's something that upset me at work or maybe I didn't get a job I really wanted we have that advantage of just like taking a moment, even sometimes I'll walk away from my computer, you know, gather my thoughts and then respond. Like these are things like we just can't do in person. So being able to regulate your emotions is definitely a strong skill to have. Um, third, respond in a timely manner. Uh, this could mean setting up even just an automated response on email, like when you're gonna be unavailable. And then also just responding in a timely manner shows that you respect other people's time, um, that you value the work that they're doing, uh, the questions they have, um, et cetera. Um, responding time and timely is also important in the, in the interview space. Um, we look for candidates that have good communication skills and just get back to us quickly. You know, the quicker you answer, um, it just shows the employers that you're prompt and you care about the feedback that you're getting and you care about the company. Uh, last, just keep it brief. Um, this helps your point get across quickly, saves time for the recipient and just increases your likelihood of the email being read in its entirety. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right, phone etiquette. I know for myself, you know, hopping on a phone call with someone can sometimes be daunting. You know, maybe I won't know the question that they're asking me, but um, the more you work on this skill set, um, the better off you will be for sure. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I was just like working on a project and I was just stumped. And I would maybe message a few coworkers, specific questions, but picking up that phone and calling, it's always provided me so much more clarity in the workspace. It would have saved me so much time when I was starting off in my career. Um, you also just get to know people and just make much better connections by hopping on a phone call. Um, so here are some of our tips. Uh, first, just use a reasonable tone while trying to maintain clarity. Um, for instance, let's say you were told to work on a project on a stressful day on the phone call. You know, try your best just to regulate your emotions, be kind, at the end of the day, like the calmer you are, um, the easier it is for you to just ask questions and get that clarity you need to successfully complete that project. Second, um, deliver your messages promptly. Try not to keep people on the phone too long. Um, if you're not available for a phone call, you know, try your best to respond back to that person quickly, um, especially in just a professional environment. And then lastly, create maybe a professional voicemail. Um, if you're in an interviewing phase, um, it is likely that you might miss a call from just an important opportunity. And you wanna make sure that you're always like showing the best version of yourself, even if you're not available. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right, the final is the video etiquette. 
Um, we are all, you know, practicing this right now. So here are some of our tips. Um, make sure to, Morgan actually covered this, make sure to mute yourself when you're not speaking in a group setting. Um, background noise coming from your video um, can come off kind of unprofessional. So, and it could take away from the presentation or even just the thought process of, you know, those around you. Um, next, engage with your body. Um, this could just mean nodding, smiling, you know, all those like nonverbal cues, you know, sitting up straight, you know, looking alert. Um, all these things can show that you're engaged, paying attention. You know, you never want to be that person that's yawning, looking out the window next to you on a video call, because honestly, it is much more obvious in the virtual workspace than it is if you're in a room of a lot of people. So it's much more obvious if you're not paying attention. Um, finally, just dress appropriately. Um, usually video calls, you know, will only show your clothes waist up, but um, we want to make sure to dress appropriately all together. Better to be safe than sorry. Um, Jamila is definitely going to talk more about this topic. So I'm going to hand it off to Jamila to talk about defining your workspace. Thank you, Megan. So yeah, we, we want to talk about defining your workspace to help you really set yourself up for success. And so let me see if I can navigate a little bit here. Who here, just the reaction, the dreaded, um, prompted, um, like no one's told you in the video calls coming, coming in. And I know I've been to the um, IBA annual meeting. I know sometimes it's our immigrant families calling on WhatsApp, someone's calling on FaceTime. Uh, and it's like that moment of fear that <laughs> like you're unprepared. And so, um, so that's kind of the mindset for this section that, that I think um, that I'm building on, that we, we built on. It's really preparing yourself for success and, um, and, and defining those spaces so that that doesn't happen to you. And so why does it matter to define your workspace? Um, well, because we know that allocating space helps with focus and creativity, organization, and this is whether you're in the office or at home. Um, defining your workspace boosts work performance and uh, also helps create boundaries. So when we're thinking about that work-life balance, um, you really can help do that by creating physical boundaries, physical space, so that your home can feel like home and work is work. Uh, that also helps prevent burnout because you, it helps with defining uh, your work time. So uh, starting work, ending, um, ending at a certain time and really establishing that work structure will also help prevent burnouts and creating those boundaries and help you disconnect from work mode. Um, you're also more, more likely to feel like you're at work and therefore pay attention if you have a space that is considered work. Um, and then it will help you be more engaged and responsive uh, to communication and all of those things. So it really is about getting you ready for work, that mindset of getting you ready for work. Um, it also helps create boundaries with um, your family and maybe pets. If, if you can point to, well, I'm in my workspace, so I'm at work, even if I'm not physically at, in a work building, it helps create that space to, to, again, help set you up for success, help prepare you and those around you. Um, you can do things like putting up a, like a baby gate or things like that to help minimize interruptions, um, to prevent distractions and, and those kinds of things. And so you're able to send that message that you are working. Um, you also want to, uh, it also helps you be more efficient. So if you have that mind, you're going in with that mindset that you're going to work, you're more likely to be in that work mode and you'll make less mistakes because you're more focused and you are going to work more efficiently. And defining your workspace also helps prevent violations. So I, I added that one um, because as actuaries and entering the actuarial world, 
you are likely going to at some point work with confidential data, with PHI, um, with protected information of some form. And so you want to make sure that you are in a space that doesn't, um, where you don't accidentally, you know, share something that you shouldn't have, have someone walk by that shouldn't see something. Uh, you know, if you're out, you know, um, working at a coffee shop and, and you have a, um, information that's confidential, clearly not going to set you up for success. So knowing where you're working and knowing that in advance and preparing your workspace also will help um, prevent breaches and um, minimize outside interaction and, and um, staying on top of those things. And I always now um, think about actuarial world, right? And I think this is my answer to everything. Actuary solve complex problems. And this applies to your work. This applies to um, how you approach things. And so when you are working on these complex problems, you want to make sure that you are putting yourself in the space to help you perform at your best so that you can focus on those things because you really are tasked with some pretty important things and some pretty complicated things. And so just setting yourself up for that success. So that's why it matters. So how do you define this workspace? Um, so these are some tips. Um, so the first thing is know what works for you if you are someone that knows that you need a lot of lighting and bright lights, don't set up in the dark corner of the basement. That's just probably not a great idea. So create the work environment that really works for you. If you know that you need to stand up a lot, put yourself in a space that will allow you to move around. So think about what when you have a project and you're like, yep, I worked really well, I was focused. Think about the things that are working for you so that you can create that work environment to help you be your best work self. And be honest about it. Be honest about your needs and, um, and setting yourself up for success. Uh, think about the kind of equipment that you need, number of screens, you know, a laptop versus a desktop, uh, what things help you um, really work at your best. If you get easily distracted, like me, don't put the TV directly in front of you. That's something I had to learn that I had to shift where my screens were pointing because I get easily distracted. And even though the TV's off, just knowing the TV's there, I want to turn it on, right? So just thinking about those things, um, I'm gonna stop giving examples, but these are notes I made to myself. Like, if you fall asleep really easily, probably don't sit on a couch to do your do your work. So again, just making sure that you're thinking about what works best for you um, and then equipping yourself. And when we talk about equipping yourself, ask your manager, your supervisor, the administrative resources, what do they offer? Do they furnish workspaces? I need a standing desk. I need a larger monitor. What things, does the company pay for? What things can you help me get so that I can perform at my best? You know, if you're working in Excel and need dual monitors, it's a that's a business need, right? Um, so um, finding those kinds of things out, finding out about internet that may impact how you um, how you set up your workspace. So at United Health, you know, we will pay for. Um, broadband internet, and then there's it has to be an ethernet hardwired connection. So then you have to think about what that workspace will look like and, um, and plan for that. But also I know I have a stable connection, which helps me um, not have any connectivity issues. Uh, also things that translate again in the works, whether you're working from home or in the office, um, thinking about what what's helpful for you. So if you are someone that gets cold easily, keeping a blanket nearby, that's something you can do at home or in the office, right? So again, equipping yourself goes not just not just for the home work life, but even if you're physically going into the office. So we always want to dress the part. And this is if you're even working from home. And so one of the things that we know from research is that our bodies associate spaces and clothing with certain activities. 
So like the first picture, the laying in bed with the dreaded video phone call. So one of the things that research says don't work in bed, which is because then when you your mind is activated and you try to go to bed, you're you no longer associate bed with rest. You're thinking you're you're like, I might be working, I might be going to sleep, I don't know. And so the same thing happens with clothes. If you're in a tire that you sleep in often, the same thing may happen. Your body's starting to get more overly relaxed. Um, and so if you're wearing things that help you again show up the way that you need to show up, um, that is beneficial. The research also shows that if you get up and get ready for work, even when you're working from home, that will show up in your performance, that you're getting your mind activated and you're saying, okay. I'm getting ready to go into work mode and your body is get, getting into that mode. And it happens by virtue of, it has to happen when you're go, physically going into the workspace. So you can recreate those routines at home to help you get into the mindset. Always be camera ready. So again, I've built on that, that unexpected phone call scenario. So being camera ready isn't just for being at home. Even when you are in the office, I always say, like, have things nearby to help you be camera ready. So keep a sweater, a blazer, a scarf, whatever thing you need to make you feel like, okay, I'm ready to show up on camera. Um, it might be that you're in the office and it's the day you decided, you know, it might be dressed on Fridays and you're in a t-shirt and jeans, which might be fine. And then you find out that the president, CEO, or some high power person that you truly respect and want to meet is um, is on site, and you might want to, you know, you might want to grab that blazer or or a scarf or you know something that just kind of gives you that pep to help you um, prepare for that. And being camera ready also means thinking about where your camera. So I know I'm moving around. I have different um, monitors, but thinking about where that camera view is, and this is again in the office or at home. If you're in the office and you're on camera and your coworkers behind you and they're getting up, standing up, going, moving around, that's potentially distracting for the other persons on the call. And then again, when you're home, thinking about those backgrounds, right? So um, I know. There are some folks that I know, the pet peeve of the bed, like all I can see is the bed and all you're thinking is, are you really at work? Are you in work mode? This just doesn't, I don't need to know that personal information about you when we're trying to talk about something else, right? So just finding things that can be neutral. We know um, based on the space that you have, some of these things you may have to adjust may not be as possible, but being mindful about it and thinking about how you're setting up your workspace, that you're presenting your best self and things that are comfortable for you and that you're sharing what you intend to share and what you want to share and not accidentally in bringing in personal things that you may not have intended to share with that specific group. Um, you know, I've talked about the company violations, security violations. So uh, data, data analysts, you know, I know actuaries, you can relate. Um, we do all this training about data uh, protection. And so thinking about that work setup that you're, again, setting yourself up to prevent errors, prevent violations, that you're not, you know, setting up where information is accessible um, in inappropriate ways. Um, always, you know, something to think about too, in terms of company guidelines, in terms of being camera ready, test out your the features that you're not using often, see how it's working, practice sharing screens, practice, you know, check your device to make sure your camera co is coming on, that it's pointing at the angle that you expected it to. So doing those tests regularly just to make sure that you are, um, that your space is set up. I know sometimes I might move around a little bit and then I find out in not when I want to find out that the camera is not where I 
you know, I had I forgot that I'd moved or I put something in the back or was hanging something that didn't need to be on screen or, you know, something like that. So um, just thinking about that. Uh, also, as Megan said, the dressing from head to toe. So one of the things I don't think we think about when like, okay, well, they're not gonna see the bottom half. That's true, unless the delivery person shows up, right? And then now there's an awkward, excuse me, and now you have to like move in a way that doesn't show your whole body. Also, the way that you're presenting, if I know that I can't stand up really without um, and, and my pajama bottoms are going to show, I'm probably going to be restricted in my movement, right? I'm going to stay very, I'm not going to move much. I'm going to be very stiff. And as you can see, I'm somewhat, I move my hands a lot. I move around a lot. And so if I'm not comfortable, even though I know it's not that it's that I'm not fully on camera, how my body language may be telling a story that's not, um, that's not as not as obvious. So just you know, when again thinking about that head to toe ca being camera ready and how it impacts you and and how you show up. So um, then the final thing here about well no before final following follow company guidelines. So whatever the co your company rules are, make sure you're following them. Most rules are rooted in some purpose, right? So there's a reason our IT people prefer us to be. Um, to you to be hardwired, right? It helps with connectivity. And so the company guidelines are there as sometimes we, we think, oh, that's a little much, but they are there to protect us. And so following the company guidelines in how you define your space and helping that inform your space is definitely important. And if you're respecting the company rules, I think that's also where you get flexibility. If you know you're doing all the things, like it's just like when you're doing your work, when you do your work, and you know that you're on top of things, other conversations go a lot easier, right? So I think the same thing applies here. When you're following company guidelines, you can make justifications for the things you need for your space and, um, and what you need to perform at your best. And then the final thing is committing to a work schedule. So again, defining your space helps with that. I'm gonna start work at a certain time, I'm gonna work at a certain time, and what that does is um, create those boundaries that we want and stick to the work schedule. There are definitely going to be times you're going to be working more or, you know, working later or uh, that you expect or on a day that you weren't planning on. And that will happen. But as much as possible, if you maintain a structure, that's also something that will help set you up for success. So... I am going to now stop talking for a little bit because we wanted to get some information out with you and share the tips, but we also wanted to engage a little bit more um, and do, do a scenario here. So I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to Claudia. All right. Well, thank you, Jamila. Thank you, Megan, for setting the stage. Um, as Jamila mentioned, we wanted to engage a bit more. And so in this way, in my role, I am going to be interviewing for a position um, that I have on my team for an actuarial analyst. And so just some background to the position and what I'm looking for. We've already in this stage interviewed a bunch of different candidates um, from an HR perspective, as well as other members of my team have also interviewed several candidates. And at this point, we have narrowed it down to two candidates, Jamila and Megan. They have different, um, there are different levels from an exam perspective. Um, Megan does have a couple more exams than Jamila. But for me, one of the things that I'm looking for is it's not just the technical ability to be able to do the job, 
both Jamila and Megan have already demonstrated in some of their earlier interviews that they're able to technically do the job. And so I'm looking for the ability for them to also assimilate into company culture, for them also to understand just what some of the drivers for why they're even getting into the profession, also trying to understand their long-term goals um, and just how it is that in this role, I would be able to help them succeed as an actuary and also what they're thinking that they're looking for and the impact that they would be able to bring, not just to our team, but the company as a whole. And so both Jamila and Megan are both um, technically able to do the job. I do know that um, in my previous um, conversations with those that have already interviewed them, Megan does have a couple more exams than Jamila. And I'm coming in now from the perspective of trying to assess both candidates and understand just what's you know some of the behind the scenes things other than what I can see on their resume to help me make that final decision in terms of who you know I would ultimately select for this role whether I would go with Jamila or I would go with Megan so with that um I will, I cannot remember who we said we were going to go with first. And so <laughs> I, I believe it was Jamila. Did I have you right? Or was it Megan that's going first? Um, I think Megan. I think Megan. Okay. Let's go with Megan. Let's go with Megan first. So um, first we have Megan. So Megan, I am thinking that she's supposed to be dialing in any second now. We did have a start time. Um, of right about now. So I'm hanging out and hoping that she's going to jump on soon. Hi, Megan. I think you're still on mute. Oh, shoot. Hello. Hi, Megan. So nice I'm so sorry I'm late. Nice to meet you. Thanks for chatting with me about the role. Thank you. Uh, it's great. It's great that you were able to join us. I know you've spoken with a couple of my colleagues. So thanks for the opportunity to catch up with me as well so I can get to know you a bit better. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to get started. Awesome. So why don't you tell me a bit about your background, why you're even interested in the actuarial profession? I know you have a couple of exams already under your belt. So tell me a bit about mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, so um, I graduated from UConn, um, studied actuarial science there. Um, I never really knew, like, growing up, you know, what I wanted to do, but um, I knew I was just good at math, um, so I just gave it a shot. Um, I did have um, an actuarial internship position, you know, last summer, um, and I've passed a bunch of exams, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm interested. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And if you think about, you know, some of your career goals, you know, short term, long term, how are you seeing yourself from a career goal perspective? And how do you see where this role will help you to accomplish some of those goals? Yeah. Um, hmm. You know, exams. I just really, really, really want to finish those exams. Um, at this point, I can't even imagine, you know, a life where I don't even have to think about taking an exam again. Um, life is going to be great when they're done. <laughs> so I want to find a full-time position that will uh, fund exams, fund study time, you know, so I can finish those as, as fast as possible. Um, I also just like heard that UHG, you know, funds a student program. So um, I really wanted to apply. Sounds good. Well, thanks for that background and that, and that, you know, insight into where you see your career going. Um, I do want to leave some room for questions. So do you have any questions for me at all that I can answer for you? Um, hmm. uh, not really at this moment. Um, I think we covered stuff I wanted to talk about. Okay. Well, it was great talking with you, Megan, and you'll definitely hear back from us. If you have any other questions that you think about after we've chatted, feel free to touch base with me and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Megan.
Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. It was great being able to catch up with Megan. And now I'm expecting Jamila. Hi, Jamila. Hi. Awesome. Right on time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Claudia. Are you okay with um, me calling you Claudia? Is yes, that your preferred that's definitely name? okay. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining. You know, I've already heard some um, great feedback from others that have spoken with you. And so I'm glad that I was able to also catch up with you as well to hear a bit about you. So, I mean, Give me some more information into your background, who is Jamila, and why you're interested in the actuarial profession. Um, give me some more insights into, into you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. So I started out a little bit later than most of my fellow, uh, most of my peers on the actuarial path. I was a math major and studied statistics um, and was really on a public health track. But then I started working um, with actuaries and then uh, really started to see that intersection with my passion around health disparities and really wanting that training that actuaries get and understanding more about that world and, and where actuarial work really applies to health equity issues. And then, um, you know, I've att I attended the IABA annual meeting and really in talking with some of the actuaries there, even though I attended not as an actuary, just the encouragement that I received to think about taking some of that, take some of the exams and get started really inspired me to get on that actuarial track. That's awesome. And that's good to hear that as well, too, because I do recall um, seeing you at a past meeting and hearing about you. And, you know, I know you through my you know actuarial network as well. And definitely I've heard about some of the work that you've done before jumping into the you know actuarial profession. So it's, it's always good to hear about how, you know, the IABA had a role in helping shift what is now, you know, your future career. So that's good to, to find out about. And when you think about your career goals, what does that what does that look like for you? Um, and how does this role help you to accomplish some of those goals? Yeah, so really learning more about the role, I, I just am thinking about where ultimately I want to go, right? I'm interested in leadership. I want to learn about different aspects of the healthcare world. I want to learn about um, just the entire industry and then understanding various roles so that when we think about solutions that I have now understood different parts of the company, of, of different companies and um, different roles that exist. And so I really wanna be a leader in um, not just as an actuary, but in the healthcare space, I'm really thinking about long-term growth. And this seems like a really good stepping stone um, to, to just that path. Um, you know, I'm also curious about what support through exams look like. I'm not, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I didn't start off as an actuary, I didn't take actuarial uh, courses in college, um, and I've been catching up, and I have been taking exams and, and have been passing, but definitely what does support look like, um, you know, something I'm thinking about, and this seems like a good role to, for that kind of support, while also developing my leadership skills, also an opportunity to come contribute to some really good work that really can have impact on communities. Um, and like I said, interest in health disparities. So when I'm thinking about impact on communities, are we doing this healthcare thing right, right? And how can I contribute to that? Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks so much for that background. Do you have any questions for me? I wanna make sure I leave some time for questions as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do, I do um, have two quick questions, hopefully sure. quick. I don't know. Um, so I'm curious about your leadership style, you know, especially as a, um, you know, I, as, as I said, coming into the field with um, this thirst for knowledge. And so curious about your leadership style and development opportunities um, as you as a leader. And then also, how do you support new employees um, coming into this, to this role? 
So I think for me, both those questions have a very similar answer. I think if we talk about the onboarding first, um, in this role, what we would do is pair you with somebody who has already, um, you know, been doing the job for some time to be able for you to tap into training. We have documentation that's very detailed that will walk you through some of the steps of just how to do your job. And then also, there is a lot of one-on-one -on -one type settings where I I would have regular one on one meetings with you. I tend to do a lot of, um, you know, shared work stream type meetings, um, almost working sessions where I also roll my sleeves up as well. And I'm walking through, you know, the different projects or tasks with you. Um, initially, you know, as a new employee, as an analyst, there would definitely be a lot of that more working sessions where, you know, I would definitely help walk you through A through Z in terms of how do we get the job done. Also, alongside some of your, um, you know, other um, colleagues who would be helping with training as well. But then to be able to continue to build on some of that leadership and communication, I can definitely see where over time, I now move into allowing you to be more independent. And so, in that, I would give you an opportunity to share the work that you're doing with your peers, to present, um, to work on some of those soft skills around communication, presentation skills. Um, and also, as you know, you've been here for a little while, we think about those that may come after you, and then you move from more being the one who is being trained to now training as well. And so I think all of those helps to not just develop you as an analyst, but develop you as a future leader, allowing you to see different areas of the organization. And so I think my management style is very twofold. It's definitely hands-on in the beginning at points, but also not in a micromanagement type of way, giving you the opportunity to succeed as well and to be independent as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claudia. This has been really helpful. I'm here taking notes of, of things that you're saying and, you know, things that resonate with me um, and things that I'm seeking from a leader um, when I think about my my future and, and that um, career development. So thank awesome. you so much. Awesome. And if you have any other questions after this interview, feel free to send me an email, reach out, and I'll definitely get back to you very quickly as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jamila. Great talking with you. All right. So as you heard, I kind of went through an interview with both Megan and with Jamila. And as I was talking with both of them before I walked into the interviews on paper, for me, Megan would have initially been the one that would have caught my eye a bit. She you know, does have more exams. She did have an internship specifically in the actuarial space. And so for me, that was initially you know, the one where I would be like, huh, maybe she does have a bit of a leg up. Um, however, as I started speaking to Megan, First of all, she didn't necessarily present herself in a way that were super professional. You know, she had on, um, you know, a hoodie, for example. She didn't have very good body awareness. She was slumped over to the side. She showed up late for the interview. She didn't have any questions, which didn't really demonstrate interest in the position. And then also, um, you know, she cared more about, you know, getting through the exams and not necessarily how is it that you know she would also contribute to uh, the company and to the role and not just um, be there for the exams? And you know, again, this is not really to get into the necessarily interview skills part, but more to address some of what you see as just basic etiquette um, in how to conduct yourself in this type of an environment, um, especially with this being a virtual session. You really have to be careful and watch a lot of your surroundings as well. Um, 
you know, one of the things that I've expressed is a pet peeve being, um, you know, I've had meetings where I've seen people with the beds in the background, right? And so I've been in some of those meetings. Um, and so in this case, um, Jamila, um, while she had one less exam than Megan, um, she had worked in the, you know, healthcare space, but not necessarily with an actuarial internship. Um, for me, she did seem somebody like somebody who would be more eager to to jump in to learn and have more future long-term potential with the company. Because for me, one of the things I would be looking for is not just making sure that you can do the job, because I think at this stage, once you get to this stage, in your careers where you've been taking exams, there are many people who can do the job. But I'm also thinking about those that are going to conduct themselves appropriately um, in the workplace, those who are going to show up professionally, and those who can be future leaders. And a lot of how you present as a future leader is it, it starts from the very beginning. And so Yes, there's some of these things that you can learn and you will continue to learn and grow, um, but how you present yourself initially does give a good first impression. And so for that reason, I would be, I would have been choosing Jamila. And I think I see us having a question um, from Emmanuel. I'm not sure if we're at the question point yet. Um, yeah, we are. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, my, my first question is, uh, with Megan, you know, uh, uh, throughout her presentation, I don't know, because of the interview, that's that's why she, like, uh, used only one name as a first name. You know, we, we can't see her surname, but then it's only first name we can see. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether it's because of the interview that was that she actually presented herself in this format, uh, in this format or in this way. And... Uh, Suppose maybe I'm being interviewed by a company and I also decide to use my first name only to present myself. Is it formal? Or let me assume maybe Megan has only one name. That's Megan. She doesn't have uh, has any surname or like last name. So let me also think in that way. And my second question is, uh, is an overview of like from the beginning to the end. And uh, it's like, suppose maybe a company, an employer uh, interviews someone from uh, any of the Arabian country and like the company interview a female person from uh, any of the Arabian country, you know, the Arabs, most of them are Muslims. So let me see, suppose a company interview a Muslim and, uh, uh, you know, Muslims, they have like, uh, the company interviewed a Muslim on Zoom meeting. Like, it should be like a face-to-face -face interview. And uh, the female decide not to sh uh, show her face. She cover her face with their face marks. And let's say the company also wants to see, uh, the employer wants to see uh, the interviewer face. And the uh, the, this Muslim says, based on my culture, I cannot show my face. So in that perspective, how is the company going to solve this problem? And is the company going to say, okay, because you don't want to show your face, I'm also not going to employ you. So let me rewind this statement. Does company, uh, does culture or customary practices affect interviews in maybe a trail field or any other field in business organizations? So I, um, so twofold. So first thing, good observation on the, for, on the name only um, for Megan, the first name. I will say I cannot, I, I don't even recall if we had that planned. Um, however, <laughs> it worked very well. Um, if your resume only has one name, then I think if your resume only has one name, there would be an expectation that you would have the one name presented in a type of virtual interview setting. If your resume does have two names on there, then it would be appropriate for you to have your name as it's presented. If it's more business etiquette, I do not think it's a make or break, but just share good business etiquette. You would have both names there. And if you think about a work setting where you might be doing email or instant message um, in the office environment, you would have the full name 
save as it would appear in your email that would also appear in your instant message as well. And so if you're trying to replicate how you would show up in the workplace, then you would have both names if you have two names. In the same way, if you're trying to think about how you would show up in a work environment as as Across the country, across the industry, we are very respectful of cultures. And so to that regard, it, if in your culture, you do wear a headdress or you do cover your face, that is not something that would in any way prohibit or inhibit or be an obstacle either in the interview process or at work in the work process as well. And so we are very respectful of different cultures and that's not something that would be an obstacle or a hindrance um, at, you know, at, at, all, at all. So I think essentially how you show up it, you know, for the interview, I would say it's very similar to how you would show up at the workplace. And in both of those, I think there's mutual respect and a part of mutual respect does take into consideration that there is no discrimination or no um, hindrances based on race, gender, cultural, um, you know, sexual orientation, anything. Um, there is no discrimination as it relates to any of that. And that also includes cultural dress, which would be in this case, um, you know, head or face coverings. Okay, so let's suppose maybe the company uh, is also mindful about uh, internet fraud, fraudsters and uh, maybe in the past years the company has been interviewing a, a lot of people and about 80% of them are like internet fraudsters and uh, so the company also decide uh, the person I want to interview, I want to see the person in person like face to face so that if the person come in person uh, to the company, I know this is the person I interview. So uh, let's suppose the one, uh, the interviewer is not the person who will be coming in person, but decides to like, because of let's say interview process and the fear of being interviewed and the kind of questions, the person decides to use someone as uh, himself or herself. So uh, if we also think in this view that the company uh, should uh, also consider cultural practices and uh, we shouldn't think about it being in, their, uh, in uh, our religious beliefs and stuff. Maybe the company will be incurring a whole lot of risks. And, you know, as the rule of an actual is to measure risk. So if we also think it in this, we assume or we manage it in this way, we are also going to incur a whole lot of risks. So, so I think the way I would look at that is first off in any risk, in any risk assessment, you look at the likelihood of, the, of it happening in the past, right? That is not something that we tend to see in the actuarial profession because it's a lot of work to put yourself through all of that. That's the first thing, right? The second thing is with any interview process, getting a job, it doesn't stop there just about every company does a background check, right? And so you have very, very intense background checks before you even start. Um, you don't even get an official full offer most times until they've completed a background check. And so as a part of that, that's where in completion of the background check, we tend to uncover things like that. And so I think there are layers involved that get you to a point where you're able to minimize any of those such risks, right? It's initially the resume, then there's an interview process. There is usually a process where your education is verified and validated. There is a background check. There is a drug testing, um, you know, process as well. And so there's several layers before, you know, you first even apply before you actually get to the interview stage, right? And then even so before you actually show up to work. And then once you show up to work on day one, at some point, 
um, <laughs> you you would get caught, right? And so I think it's it, the the layers that it would take to go through that. I, I think um, it, you would you, it's very likely that you would get caught along the way. Um, and again, it is as we talked about a very small network where everybody knows everybody, and so it, that's also something that we factor in in the process as well because we recognize that folks would it would be in their best interest to also um, do the right thing the first time around because if you were to get stopped say on day one the very the chance is that just about any other company that you went to would hear that you did something like that at your previous interview. And so I think all of those things are things that you take into account from a risk assessment perspective when you make a determination that ultimately, um, you know, the decision that you made to employ somebody is the right position, is the right decision. And with anything, that's why with this interview, it wasn't just about you know, the exams on paper, but also an assessment of some judgment as well um, through the process. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I see two other hands. Um, Josephine, I think I saw your hand go up. Thank you so much. So sure. my question is, so let's say um, Megan came in unprepared and then nervous, she wasn't composed, but then in the course of the interview, she answers the question how you wanted it. And then Jamila comes in composed with all the appropriate mannerisms and everything. But then she also gives some good responses, but not up to your expectations. So in that case, what do you do? Would you say because um, Megan came in not prepared and nervous, or you use that against her or you actually go for the one with the composure because she'll be able to better represent your company like i would like to know yeah so i think it ultimately comes down there is going to be some judgment call involved i think for megan it wasn't just the you know perceived lack of unpreparedness but also even her showing up in her attire right so it wasn't just her being nervous it was she didn't show essentially interest in really showing up and so that was really the, the, the differentiator right you know throwing on a sweater to come for example being nervous is not an obstacle i would say especially as an analyst um you know it's probably the first time you're going through a set of interviews maybe you've done an internship maybe not but being nervous is definitely not a disqualifier for um you know getting the position i think ultimately you know being able to answer questions that is something that is considered. If you also notice, Megan didn't have any questions for me either. And mm -hmm. so her not having any questions for me, that was also more of a red flag that it wasn't that she wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't just nervous. It was that she was very unprepared. And, and so I think that is really more of why that decision went in that favor. I think ultimately you're looking at more of a general package. You definitely accept that somebody can be nervous. You're also looking to hear what the answers that they're coming up with. Um, the truth is, I have never gone into an interview and had expectations about what the right answer is always going to be. I see an interview for me personally as more of a conversation where I'm looking to get to know you better. And also, I think any interview is a two-way street. I don't think as the interviewer, I'm only the one interviewing you. I would expect that you're also showing up to essentially interview me and decide why it is that you want to work at this company company because this is something that I don't want you to dread going to work on a Monday morning right and so I want to make sure that it's a two-way street and so in you know if we're thinking about just the etiquette portion of it which again we're going to get into more interviewing type skills in the next module um but just focusing more on the etiquette piece here that's where you know how Megan showed up was very different than how Jamila actually showed up and presented herself. And that was really a lot of uh, what was more of a red flag for one that may indicate how you may or may not show up to work when the time comes. Thank you. Yeah. And Claudia, I just wanna to add to um, one thing, there were supposed to be some things I did, but then I went into interview mode and didn't do the things that we discussed. 
to show recovery, right? And so not just in interview settings, there are going to be times, the nerves, the, the computer connectivity, the error is going to, that's just going to happen. And it's about how you recover, right? So it's not just if I do these five things, but just you, the entire assessments. And when we think about business etiquette, that's part of it. Like there's going to be a time you're going to make a mistake, but how you recover, how you show interest, how you engage with your leader after that error matters, right? So owning it, that, that accountability, that creating that relationship with your leaders. Um, and this is why all these things matter because it allows those conversations to go a lot smoother because you've been showing this engagement and you're doing these things, not just because it's a checklist, because you care about your work, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I said, you know, when we do these things, it's not, it's to prevent company violations, it's to prevent distractions, it's prevent. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to perform well, right? And so, you know, the recovery matters too. Okay, thank you so much. We have a couple more hands up. It looks like uh, Michael, would you like to go next? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me. You're a bit low. I can't hear you that well. Hello, is it okay now? Yes, yes it, it's, a, it's better. Oh, okay, so I'm Michael from Ghana, and my first question is, so assuming you send somebody an email, okay, and you wait for probably a week, you don't get any response. Now you send a follow-up email and the person responds, noted, okay, but so you wait for an extra week and the tax is not done. What are you supposed to do again? So that's my first question. And for my second question, it's about the mock interview. So let's say Megan comes in unprepared. Is it appropriate for her to reschedule another interview or what does, how does she go by it? Maybe probably she's having a bad day. Is it appropriate for her to schedule another interview? So this is my two questions. Thank you. So I think um, first, in, first question related to emails, I think that's where it comes down to continuous communication. When you, when you send an email and there's no response and then there's a follow-up and the follow-up is just noted, you know, looking back at what was the time frame of the original request? Was there a, re, was there a, a deadline attached to that email? If you have not, um, if you don't have a deadline attached to the email and you are, you know, caring about your work, one of the things that I like to do is I like to say, I, I've received your email. Can you please let me know the anticipated time frame for completion? Just so I'm also keeping track of the tasks that I have to do. And it's not just a noted. And so I think that's where the two-way communication comes in, you know, following up with your manager during your, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations. I received this email. Um, I have this deadline. If it's some a deadline that you're going to struggle with meeting, being up front as well. Um, and so it's not just, you know, noted or received, but this is how I'm working towards completing it. And so I think that's how I think about emails in general. Remember, emails are all e emails kind of are like paper trail to the actual work that you're doing, but it doesn't replace some of the phone, the actual conversations that you're having with people. And so I think for me, one of the things I like to think about work is, yes, you're trying to get a job done, but you're also building relationships. The difference between, you know, enjoying your work and the difference between um, progressing through your career and becoming a leader tends to hinge on relationships. And so that is something that it's always going to be difficult to just do over email. And so it's continuing to have those conversations, understanding what your deadlines are and making sure that you're able to meet them. And if not, then you're able to have have some, um, you know, some some follow up and some some back and forth with your manager on that. And so that's how I would think about the emails. Um, and for me, if I think about the interview, um, the second part of your question related to Megan, I think it, it's if there's something comes up that is unavoidable, then 
you can reschedule. I do think though, that what does that look like? Um, it is not okay to not be ready because, you know, I didn't have my shirt ironed, you know, that to me, that that's, that's, that's more unacceptable. If you have lost your internet connection, for example, that's unanticipated, um, and it happens. And so, but the, it's, the key is saying something up front or reaching out in advance or saying at the beginning, I apologize, I had an unexpected emergency. Is it possible for me to reschedule? I think saying that up front and taking accountability back to what Jamila said, it's all about the accountability. That is where you're able to recover from that. But if you go through 15 minutes and then at that point you say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't have lunch today. And so my, you know, head is out of the game. Things like that tend to show um, a lack of business etiquette. And so that's where I think you have to consider your circumstances. Yes, there may be things that are unavoidable. And if you're not able to show up for one reason or the other, um, that is something you can recover from. But if you are, for example, you know, missing a couple, like you do that maybe two, three times, at that point, it's like, do you really want this interview, right? Um, or what's the reason? So I think it's all about taking accountability and being upfront. Yeah, and take advantage of all those variables that we control ourselves. So internet connection, we can't control, but I could have controlled, you know, having a hoodie on, you know, those things, just take advantage of stuff that you can control too. Yes. I hope that answered your question, Michael. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Perfect, perfect. All right, and then we have one more question. You go ahead and ask your question. Hi, everyone. Hi. Like my question is about uh, over responding to an interview question. I want to ask if there are implications to over responding to an interview question. For instance, in the course of an interview, you have been asked a question and you responded to over responded to the question in such a way that you responded to the next two questions the interviewer has in his book. Are there implications? So I think when we talk about over responding, um, over responding is really more getting into a lot of sometimes personal type um, situations. I, I think if any interview for me is really more conversational. And so if you are addressing a question and it happens to answer the next question I had on my list, then as an interviewer, I'm just going to take note of that and then ask you another question or a follow-up question. Um, it may not be that, that next question that I had because you already answered, but it may be more like, you know, thanks for that response. That's exactly, that was gonna be my next question. Um, so let's, let's expand on that some more. And I may use that as an opportunity to get into another question. I, I think um, a lot of times with interviewers, yes, there's some questions that, uh, you know, you tend to get asked a lot, but it's really more of a conversation because we've seen your resume. We know what's on your resume. And oftentimes we know what you're able to do. We know your GPA. We know all of those things, right? And so what we want to understand is how are we going to work together? And I think that comes down to more of a conversation. And if you think back to always thinking through how am I showing up here and how is this going to reflect how I show up at work? If I'm showing up, you know, at work and we're talking and working through a project, for instance, and you anticipate, all I'm going to say is, you know, that's a good point. I was going to get to that next. So I think we've already crossed that one off the list. Let's move on to the next task and figure out how we're going to tackle this problem. And so if you think about it that way, that the interview is really more a conversation and setting the stage for how you're going to show up at work on a daily basis, uh, you know, over, you know, responding, um, th that is more of a natural conversation. Um, that part, it, you know, is not something I have a concern with. Where you get into over response is if I ask you about your 
you know, GPA, for example, and maybe your GPA was a 3.2. I'm just making this up. And you say, you know, I got a 3.2 because last year I had to go on a vacation here. And then I got stuck in Taiwan. <laughs> and then, you know, my bag got lost. And then, you know, you know, when you start getting into all these things, then at that point, I'm like, uh, you know, maybe I didn't need to know that, you know, you were on a two hour, you know, two day layover in, I don't know. So those, th that's where you start getting into things that are not relevant, right? But if you're having a conversation where it's relevant to the potential job and your um, capabilities and your ability to do the job, um, I, I think it's really more of a conversation than an over response. Yeah, and I'd like to add to sometimes those are indicators about the person, um, either if that person is someone who you'll be working with or a leader, <clears throat> their leadership style. <clears throat> so, right, um, for example, Claudia repeated things to me that I shared. She showed me that she was listening, interested in my journey. So I do think if I answer a question and I say, and I say, I know, you know, one of my one of the things I'm working on an opportunity for girls is um, my moving my, I move my hands a lot and something I'm working on. And then the next question is, is there anything you're working on? What's an opportunity for growth? And you don't acknowledge things I have shared. It also tells me you're just reading your list and you're not actually engaging with me too. And so that's also an opportunity for you in the, or so that's one thing. Let me pause there. So that's one thing. It can be an indicator for you. Two, what you thought you communicated wasn't communicated, right? So if you so sometimes you think you've answered a question and you hear it show up a different way, that could also mean that it wasn't quite clear. And that's something that translates beyond the interview, which we're trying to make sure we focus on the business as kids of things. Um, because if my manager asked me a question multiple ways, Usually it means I haven't actually gotten to what she was trying to get me mm -hmm. to, to understand. So there are also some indicators there, um, you know, if it, if it comes up again. But, but as Claudia said, I mean, she covered the actual um, question about oversharing when it's relevant. You know, you shouldn't worry about, well, what if I answer other things? That's great that you, that you were thinking ahead and that you're able to engage with, with the person that way. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, we did have one more. Ophelia, did you still have a question or were you were you okay? Yeah, she answered one of my questions. So Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. O overshare it and answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, and then I believe this will be our last question uh, from Michael. Oh, okay. Um, I want to know whether you are obligated to get social with co-workers. Like, are you obligated to get social with co-workers? I want to know, and how do you go by it? You know, because sometimes during the weekends, they will probably invite you to come for drinks and stuff. Is it, are you, are you supposed to go or not to go? Like, I want to know how you go by it. <laughs> Who's taking that one? I was going to say, I think that's time. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, you sorry, Claudia, you, you have the most experience. I can add other things. Yeah. So, so for me, are you obligated? The answer is always going to be no. You're not obligated. Um, I think any, what the way how I see it is I see it more as is there um, advantages to networking and continuing to network? There will always be advantages to networking. Um, I have very rarely found myself doing things outside of, um, you know, work on the weekends personally. Um, yes, you may have gatherings after work where, um, you know, the group may get together for like a happy hour. Um, you And, you know, I may pop in for an hour, for example, um, to network network or maybe just more to get to know people differently outside of work, which is always a nice thing. Um, but am I obligated to? I am not. Um, what I do think is very valuable 
is building relationships. It comes back to building relationships. And a part of building relationships at work is knowing more about people other than um, this is the pricing that you're doing or you're on this team or on this task. Um, do you need to know more to get your job done? Probably not. But is it helpful to be able to have good working relationships if, you know, you probably show up, um, you know, to work and you could say, you could say to somebody, hey, how's your daughter doing today? And they said, oh, she's doing great. Thank you so much. And then it makes people feel like not only do you care about the actual work that they're doing, but you care that, you know, um, you care about them as a person. And so I think, are you obligated to? The answer to that will always be no, you're not obligated. Um, but is there some, you know, value in networking and what does networking truly look like if you think about for example in the profession you know iaba meetings going to iaba meetings things like going to an iaba meeting is not a work event necessarily but you have the opportunity to meet people outside of your company to network with people you have the opportunity to you know possibly have future job opportunities that come out of that um as well too those will always be good things you know you think about going to you know the society of actuaries or the cas meetings once you get your associateship or your fellowship when you go to those meetings yes you're going for continuing education but you're also going to network they have a whole networking reception as part of the society of actuaries as part of the iaba meetings you know there's an awards reception as part of the iaba meetings as well all of those things is because when you're going to work every day, one of the ways that you don't, you know, dread going to work every day is if you're actually, you know, knowing people on a level that's outside of just your nine to five and you're celebrating their um, wins as well. Um, and, you know, you're, you're, you're really truly networking with folks and you don't have to do that with everybody as well. I, I you know, I've been in the career for 20 years and there's some actuaries that I have very deep relationships with that I met 20 years ago. And there's some of them that if I walked right past them right now on the road, I probably wouldn't know who they are, right? And so it, there's a balance. And so I think it's up to you to kind of strike that balance. And also with your personality, right? Some people are not extroverts. I talk a lot, right? Everybody knows that. Some people are more introverted, but even as an introvert, maybe there is one or two people that you may be able to connect to that you can network with, um, even if it's more of a mentor-mentee style relationship, um, I would encourage that even within your own company, that there is at least one person that you can, can tap into and continue to build a relationship with outside of, you know, the Excel spreadsheet that you're going to be staring at for 40 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think it, it's the knowing yourself and knowing your own boundaries. So just like with the defining workspace, when I said, if you're someone who needs a lot of bright light, don't set up in the dark corner of the basement, I would say the same thing about being social. If you are, if you're not a, not a drinker, you know, what if there's things that, um, <clears throat> that you don't want to get too personal about, then don't enter that conversation. Like maybe it isn't going to happy hour and maybe it is um, volunteering to help with the potluck or the, you know, or, um, or asking someone about coffee or, you know, something that is more comfortable, but maybe you're okay going out to the happy hour, but it's okay not to drink. It's okay to, to, to get a non-alcoholic beverage. So you, you, but you also have to own that. You know, this, sometimes we feel that pressure. It's happy hour, everybody's gonna be drinking. Well, you don't have to be, you don't have to drink. And if anyone makes you feel bad about that, that's, you, you have to just know your own boundaries. Um, you know, I wouldn't put on other, you have to know your own boundaries. And I think sometimes coming up with the things you're comfortable sharing. So I have like the things that I know, I love talking about my nephew. I love, like there are a couple of personal things that, I know I'm comfortable with sharing and I'm able to connect with a person about these things. So seeking those specific things that still allow you to be comfortable, but share because 
and then making sure you know that in advance. Because if you feel, if it comes from pressure and discomfort, that's when you might enter the space of sharing something you didn't mean to, right? And I've been that person several times because I was like, oh my gosh, everyone's talking about their personal life and they're going into deep things. I'm going to share this really deep personal story. And now suddenly I'm talking about an uncomfortable topic that I didn't need to go into that nobody needed to know. So I get, so I think just being prepared with, okay, I know I'm, know what spaces I'm comfortable in physically. I know what conversations I'm comfortable um, sharing about. And so just knowing that about yourself and putting yourself in those specific settings, but seeking those things out. So you might find out, you may not know yet, but try a version of it. Okay, I'm not sure I'm ready for happy hour, but does anyone ever get coffee or does, are there tea drinkers around, right? So just kind of finding like where your comfort level is and then what things you're comfortable with and then building on that. Because as Claudia said, it is about building relationships because it does translate into the work relationship. You're able to communicate a lot more efficiently when you have that relationship with your coworkers. It's just, it's just things just flow a lot smoother. Then also you're able to talk about work in a more direct way because you have that relationship. You know that it's not because I don't like you or like these other factors don't seep in because you have that relationship. So now I think it actually helps weirdly allow work to, to stay as work sometimes because you know that you have that personal relationship that can always recover no matter what's going on in this um, work with, with this work specific interaction. And I will say too, it doesn't have to always be personal. It can be a connection over the NBA playoffs. It can be, you know, I, I like okay. to talk about Usain Bolt. Like, I, I mean, I'll talk about Usain Bolt from now till tomorrow. It could be talking about the World Cup, you know. Um, or maybe and you're taking the same exam. Been back, and of course, Ghana was there, but the reggae boys were not. So, you know, <laughs> it doesn't. It it doesn't have to. You you do have your boundaries, you know. Um, and I, I think in any situation, um, there is always like. A, at least one thing that you may be able to have some type of a connection on. And it doesn't have to, again, be with everybody. It could be, you know, with one person that makes coming to work every day more enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you. It really answers the question very well. Perfect. Uh, Jamila, did you have another slide that you wanted yeah, to Yeah, so um, if I can go back to you. All right. Um, so thank you. <laughs> let's, let's make sure that, that we say thank you, thank you, thank you um, to you all for your engagement. I love the questions. See, I love the conversation um, of all of that. We also have some links um, that we have asked to be shared with, with you all. Am I the only one having a hard time hearing her? I was having a hard time hearing her just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, I agree. It goes in and out a bit, Jamila. Yeah. Oh, is it probably because I'm moving around? Um, now you I sound think good. The, okay. The noise, the noise uh, cancellation of the mic sometimes work against me because I move around and then it no longer picks up the speech. Um, so the outside of thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to you all, to um, um, IBA, to you all as participants. We also wanted to share uh, just some quick links that will be, some links that will be shared after this. Um, it has career opportunities at United Health Group. And so United Health Group is United Healthcare plus Optum. So we have the links to how you can look up for job, look for job, jobs using the um, terms that you would like to. Then we also just have some information about our careers in general. We have information for about internships and recent graduates. Then we also um, have a way for you to input your information so that you can be um, in, entered into our 
um, into our, uh, just so you can be alerted about community, op community career opportunities and a little bit about our culture and what working for United Health Group looks like and um, about us. So culture aspects and then a little bit more about the company. So these links will go out to you, but just thank you for your engagement and hopefully we will meet some of you in person at the annual meeting. Um, I know some of us will be there, so hopefully we will meet some of you in person. Thanks for having us. Yes, yes, thank you thank all you. so much. Thank you, thank you, Claudia, Jamila, and Megan. Thank you so much for jumping on today's call and leading this amazing, amazing session. Uh, I will, as Jamila mentioned, uh, follow up with some of with the links and the PowerPoint, just so that you can, you know, have that for your reference as well. Uh, just to wrap up for you all, um, there's just some information that they need as boot camp students. So just to give you that uh, info and animal of the day, which is fish. So yes, fish like swimming in the ocean sea. Uh, when you're filling out your Google form, that is the animal of the day that you will use. Uh, to fill that out with. And module seven does close tonight at midnight and module eight will be due May 31st. So make sure you get that Google form in if you are interested in attending the annual meeting. Uh, lastly, we do have our town hall for IABA next week. Uh, it is May 24th at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And we are currently taking nominations for IABA board members. So uh, definitely check that out as well. I'll include all of this information in the email. Uh, so yeah, I am going to go ahead and wrap up today's session. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our participants on and off camera. And I look forward to catching up with you all and providing more information soon. All right. All right. You all have a good one and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye